Hey guys, welcome back and thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Sherry. I'm excited to tell you that this is my 50th show. I love doing this and I'm so grateful for each one of you who take the time to listen in and you're the reason I keep doing this and that means you, yes you, listening right now. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Today's story is about a famous ship and its occupants. It's the most famous ghost ship case out there. I talked to you about a lot of true crime, but I'm not sure if there was even any crime taking place in the story at all. My sources are listed in the description area. This is the case of the Mary Celeste. Let's set our dials back to 1872 and get in that time frame. Just some highlights from that year. Yellowstone became the first national park. Women's rights activist Susan B. Anthony voted for the first time and was arrested shortly after since only men were allowed to vote. She was fined $100, which is $2,400 in today's money. Ulysses S. Grant won a second presidential term. On average, horses cost $60, pigs were $5, cows were $20, and goats were $2. People still used gas lights and candles in their homes. Electricity wouldn't be available in the average home until 1925. Even then, only half of all homes had working electric. And lastly, in 1872, a pound of rice cost 11 cents. There's a brigantine ship by the name of the Mary Celeste. It was owned by a man named James Winchester. It was built in 1861. But in early 1872, the ship is going to get a major renovation done to it. The renovation cost $10,000, which in today's money is $236,000. That's a whole lot of work on one ship. The length of the ship was increased to 103 feet. The depth was increased to 16 feet. As well, a second deck was added. So this ship is like super nice. And just to give you guys a visual, it looks like something you would see in a movie about pirates. It's big and it has these huge sails. The ship's captain was a 37-year-old man named Benjamin Briggs. Captain Briggs is a Christian, and he doesn't drink, and he spends a lot of time reading his Bible and going to a lot of prayer meetings. His wife is 31-year-old Sarah. At the time the story takes place in 1872, their son Arthur is 7 years old, and their daughter Sophia is 2. Captain Briggs is a very experienced captain. And he will be taking the Mary Celeste out on her first voyage since the major renovations were completed. Now, the older child, Arthur, is going to stay back with his grandmother so he can attend school. On the voyage will be Captain Briggs, his wife, Sarah, their two-year-old daughter, Sophia. His first mate is a man named Arthur, who is married to the niece of the ship's owner. Second mate is a man named Andrew. And the rest of the crew were four German men, and I don't know their names, but they are described as peaceful human beings. Captain Briggs had handpicked this crew of men. He wanted to do this carefully since his wife and young daughter would be on board. His wife, Sarah, told her mother in a letter that they were hardworking, competent men. In a letter Captain Briggs wrote to his mom just before they took off, he tells her the following. Now, this is just a small portion of the letter, but it kind of gives you an idea of Captain Briggs. And keep in mind, this was written 150 years ago. Quote, We seem to have a very good mate and steward, and I hope I shall have a pleasant voyage. We both have missed Arthur, and I believe we should have sent for him if I could have thought of a good place to stow him away. Sophia calls for him occasionally and wants to see him in the album, which, by the way, is a favorite book of hers. She knows your picture in both albums and points and says, Grandma. She seems real smart. She's gotten over her bad cold she had when she came, and she has a first-rate appetite for hash and bread and butter. I think the voyage will do her lots of good. 
we enjoy our melodion and have some good sings. I had to look up what a melodion is, and it's kind of like a mix between an old-timey organ and an accordion. You can tell Captain Briggs is looking forward to the trip, and he just adores his daughter Sophia. I'll link the full letter in my sources in case you guys wanted to read the whole thing. So there's going to be 10 people total on this ship, and it's going to get loaded in New York with cargo. The cargo is 1,701 barrels of industrial strength alcohol, and it will be taken to Italy. On November 5th, 1872, the ship is on its way. It sets out in the Atlantic Ocean, and all is well. It's November, and the water is freezing and icy. On December the 4th, this is a month since the Mary Celeste left the harbor in New York. Well, there is another ship making its way to Italy carrying a different cargo. This ship's name is the De Gradia. Now, the De Gradia was following almost the same path as the Mary Celeste, but it had left the harbor around eight days after the Mary Celeste did from the next state over, which is New Jersey. The captain of this ship is Captain David Morehouse. Like Captain Briggs, he has a crew of men on his ship. They're sailing along, and they see a large ship in the distance. And there's something eerie about this ship, though. They can see from a distance, using a early version of binoculars, that some of the sails are only partly set, and the ship appears to be damaged. Not badly damaged, but it's like someone hasn't been adjusting the sails for a few days, and weather has destroyed part of them, and there's ropes hanging loosely over the side. They notice the ship is just kind of floating. It's not making any progress. It just sits there like it's just aimlessly moving around with no regard to direction. One of the sailors comments, it appears there must be a drunken man at the wheel since she's just kind of moving all over the place. As they get closer to the ship, they notice other things that bother them, such as the only lifeboat on the ship is missing. They also see no one is on board. Usually, if another ship is coming towards you, the crew will stand out on the deck and wave and yell to you as you get closer. It's 1872. People still communicated with strangers back then. But no one is on the deck. There's no distress signals coming from the ship. As they draw near to the ship, Captain Morehouse recognizes the name written on the ship's bow, the Mary Celeste. In fact, he had met Captain Briggs just a month prior and even had dinner with him and his wife. He explains to his men that Captain Briggs is a well-respected, very experienced captain and something is very wrong here. He also knows the Mary Celeste should have already made it to Italy by now. He orders his first and second mate to get on their lifeboat and head over to the Mary Celeste and see what they can find on board. There could be people in the cabin below that are hurt or sick or need medical attention. So the first and second mate exit the De Gradia and climb aboard the Mary Celeste. They confirm there was no one on board. It was pretty spooky, in fact. All they hear is the wood creaking below their feet and the water hitting the sides of the ship, the tattered sails blowing in the wind. The first thing they notice, besides how eerily quiet it is, is that the ship is in excellent condition. There is absolutely nothing wrong with it. Everything is in good working condition. There is no reason an experienced captain like Captain Briggs would abandon a perfectly operating ship. They found that even their pipes and all their belongings were left behind, which is really strange. Most smokers, even today, aren't going to leave their cigarettes somewhere. They found at least six months' worth of food and supplies that were untouched, not a single soul on board. The ship's wheel is spinning aimlessly on the deck. Rain and ocean water had gotten in below the deck. There was about three and a half feet. But this isn't a lot in reality. It wouldn't take you very long to pump out the water. Water gets in all the time. It's like if you walked outside and saw a foot of snow. All you have to do is shovel your sidewalk. You're not going to grab your family and flee from your house. Captain Briggs would have seen the water and just had his team pump it out. No big deal. Now, some of the hatches were open, and it's likely that the water got in after they disappeared. The bottom line is that the water below the deck was not a cause for concern. One of the De Gradia crew members says that this ship is fit to go around the world. They go down into the captain's quarters and find the captain's clothes, Sarah's clothes, the baby's little bed, 
They find children's toys that belong to Sophia, a sewing machine. Things were wet down there, though, from water getting in the skylights and the doors. There was nothing that indicated there was a fire or any kind of violence. Whenever they departed the ship, they did so very calmly and organized. In the first mate's cabin, they found the daily log. They hope that this will give them some kind of an idea about what happened. It shows the last entry was 8 o'clock a.m. on November 25th, nine days beforehand, and 20 days after the Mary Celeste took off from the harbor. It read that the ship's position was 400 miles from where the De Gradia found her. It had moved quite a bit in nine days. The ship's log showed nothing out of the ordinary. It talked about some bad weather they had experienced at some point in the trip, but everything seemed fine on November 25th when the last entry was made. They get back in the De Gradia and they explain to Captain Morehouse what they found. They're trying to brainstorm exactly what to do here. The captain is especially concerned because he knew Captain Briggs and considered him an acquaintance. The rest of the De Gradia crew doesn't know Captain Briggs, and they're thinking about that definition of maritime law, which is, a discoverer who finds a shipwreck pursuant to the law of fines is entitled to the full value of the goods that are recovered. Since the owner of the vessel has given up trying to recover the shipwreck, the discoverer is deemed to have full rights to the content. Now, this ship isn't wrecked, and I don't have the exact verbiage from 1872, but basically, if a ship is abandoned and someone discovers it, they will be paid for the ship and its contents. The sailors suggest they bring the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar, where they can file a claim and be paid. They know that by doing this, they will be paid $46,000. In today's money, that's a little over a million dollars. Split amongst the men, they would receive the equivalent to $100,000 apiece. So a lot of money is at stake here. Now, Captain Morehouse isn't crazy about this idea, though. It's not as simple as it seems. There's a storm heading their way. Everything will have to go exactly perfect with no room for error whatsoever. It's going to take them at least a week to bring the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar. But these working class men would get a huge payday if all goes well. Eventually, the captain was able to be convinced, and they spend the next seven days bringing the Mary Celeste to Gibraltar. I read a lot of sources that state it was towed, but on a site called Mary Celeste Facts Not Fiction, it says that the first mate and other members of the crew actually sailed the boat parallel to the De Gradia since it was in good operating condition. When they arrive, they file a claim for the money, but the attorney general, who is a man named Frederick Solly Flood, wants to learn more. He is completely in awe of the whole situation and says a thorough investigation needed to happen before he'll even begin entertaining their claim. He doesn't believe that these men just found a perfectly good ship floating in the Atlantic with no one on board. He is beginning to think the crew of the De Gradia did something to the crew of the Mary Celeste and is now looking for a payday. The Mary Celeste hearings begin on December 18th. The attorney general interrogates the men pretty hard on the stand. He even accuses Captain Morehouse of trying to cover up evidence, but he is having a hard time finding any real proof of any wrongdoing on the De Gradia's part. The attorney general sends a court surveyor out to examine the Mary Celeste. This person finds that everything the De Gradia crew said does check out. He sees there was new renovations done to the ship by the ship's owner. He also finds some things on the ship that weren't found by the De Gradia's crew. So remember, there are 1,701 barrels of alcohol in the ship. Well, nine of those barrels had been emptied. He also found strange cuts on the ship's bow. A small sword was found in the captain's cabin. On the sword was a red substance. It was examined and a chemical test was done. The red substance ended up being rust that had just gotten wet. Although it did resemble blood, it was really just rust in the end. The attorney general is kind of running out of ideas, but he's still reaching here. He considers that maybe the ship's owner, Jay Winchester, and Captain Briggs may have had some kind of insurance scam since Captain Briggs was a partial owner of the ship, but he only owned a very small share. 
But the problem with this is that the ship was only insured for $16,000. The cargo on the ship was valued at $36,000. So it wouldn't make sense to collect $16,000 in insurance money when they could have just completed the trip and received more than twice that amount. Finally, Attorney General Flood has run out of ideas. He agrees that the De Gradia crew had nothing to do with the disappearance of the Mary Celeste crew. As well, remember, Captain Morehouse was initially opposed to the idea of bringing the ship in. His men had to convince him to do this. Their reward money is finally granted. However, it was much smaller than expected. The De Gradia crew was just happy to get something out of it, and they're glad that they're not under investigation any longer. It's so mysterious that these folks could just up and vanish. A seasoned captain abandon his ship, and for what? Even the most rational theories seem to have reasons for why they didn't happen that way. And let's get into some of them. We talked about the possibility of an insurance scam. Again, they would have gotten twice that amount if they just completed the delivery. There was always the threat of pirates. Pirates were a trending subject back in the 1800s, but mostly in books. The probability of running into a pirate in real life was much smaller. If you did encounter pirates, they just take what is on the ship. They rob you. They don't care about you. Everything was still there, including all of the ship's cargo. So pirates are pretty unlikely, or they're the worst pirates imaginable. Could the four German sailors have turned on the captain? We don't know a lot about these men but they were handpicked by Captain Briggs. As well, remember his wife, Sarah, wrote her mom and said that they were hardworking, honest, good men. There wasn't any clues on the boat that showed signs of blood or anything that showed a struggle. Could they have gotten drunk from the alcohol cargo and attacked the captain? Well, the alcohol that was in these 1,701 barrels is not the kind of alcohol you would want to drink. It's similar to industrial strength formaldehyde. Drinking it could cause you to die. Imagine drinking a gallon of rubbing alcohol. There wasn't any normal alcohol on the ship. Remember, Captain Briggs is a Christian who doesn't drink at all. He's not going to have his crew drinking and carrying on on a ship. But even if the sailors did manage to overtake the captain, there's no reason for them to leave the safety of the ship. I also wanted to point out that the ship's chronometer, which is a device that measures time and helps with position, along with the ship's papers, were not found on the ship. There's also been theories about a giant squid. These things are real, and the largest ever recorded is 43 feet. That's almost half the size of the boat. It's hard to know what's lurking in the water. Scientists believe there are a number of unknown, very large underwater creatures which have not yet been discovered. But a giant squid the size of a tractor trailer throwing his tentacles on top of the deck would surely have left the ship in a mess. There would be broken boards and so on. It probably would have capsized and sunk the ship. There was always the chance it could have been ergot poisoning. Ergot is a black fungus disease type stuff that grows in rye and wheat and it can make its way to breads. I looked up photos of it and it's pretty gross. It looks like like black pieces of rice almost and it's popping out of wheat. It's really just nasty. Um, it's like little black spores. Even today, cereal companies have to test for for this. If consumed, it can cause paranoia and hallucinations. And some people do take this stuff as a way to hallucinate. One source stated it could have been that each member of the ship got ergot poisoning, they hallucinated, and they jumped off the boat. There was rye bread on the Mary Celeste, but the folks from the De Gradia who sailed the Mary Celeste to land consumed the food and nothing happened to them, so we can rule out ergot hallucinations. The next are these things called whirlpools. I had to watch some YouTube videos of them. They're basically a tornado in the ocean. They are tall and they look terrifying. It looks like a tornado that's on top of the water and it reaches the sky. Like, it is just really scary. I even saw a video of a small one that happened in a hotel pool. Anyway, this would do a lot of damage to a ship. We would have seen damage on the Mary Celeste from the Whirlpool if it encountered it. As well, it wouldn't make sense to get in a small lifeboat in freezing waters when the giant ship would have provided more protection from the Whirlpool. 
And anytime you look up anything about this ship, you'll likely read that there was always a chance that it could have been aliens. I'm not saying there's zero chance that it was, but this seems like the least likely of the theories. Our mind begins to look at outlandish scenarios when we don't have a reason for something, and I feel we're reaching pretty far with this one. Could it have been aliens? Yes, but likely not. I don't think the aliens are going to order them into their lifeboat. Plus, aliens usually return you back to wherever you came from once they're done experimenting on you or whatever else aliens do to you. The most likely theory was written by Captain Briggs' nephew, Dr. Oliver Cobb. I also read that he was his cousin, fact checkers. I don't know if he's his cousin or a nephew, but they are related. What he wrote is the most reasonable explanation, and what many today, including myself, believe is what actually happened to the crew of the Mary Celeste. According to the website Genealogy Trails, Dr. Oliver Cobb wrote that this is what likely happened, and it does make total sense. Captain Briggs, even though he was a fantastic captain, he had never handled a cargo of alcohol before. His ship was loaded in cool weather, but on November 25th, as it reached warmer climates, the fumes began to escape from the ship's hold And these fumes are bad, like really awful industrial alcohol. Think rubbing alcohol fumes in large doses. The fumes escape and a loud rumbling was coming from below in the cargo hold. Captain Briggs orders the hatch to be removed and allows the gases to escape. While the men were doing this, there was an explosion and the hatch was overturned. This would explain the nine barrels of alcohol that were empty, although I did read that those nine barrels were a different type of oak wood than the rest of the, which could have resulted in being more porous and leaked out. The small explosion, which may have sounded a lot more fierce than it really was, alarmed everyone and sent the crew into a panic. They all get in the lifeboat expecting that the ship is going to blow up any minute. All the other barrels are going to explode. Captain Briggs grabbed the chronometer and the ship's papers. He gets in the lifeboat with his wife, daughter, and sea crew. Either the lifeboat capsizes or they begin trying to row as fast as possible away from the ship. They sit in the lifeboat and observe the Mary Celeste from a distance awaiting an explosion. Once the danger was over and they knew the ship wasn't going to blow up, a strong breeze either blew their lifeboat further away or blew the ship further away from them. They can't get back to the Mary Celeste and they're too far from shore. So they likely died at sea on the lifeboat or the boat capsized and they all went into the icy cold water. Bottom line is that abandoning a ship in the open sea is the last thing a captain would order and a sailor would be hesitant to follow through with. Even today, a captain would only order this under life-threatening circumstances, especially in a small lifeboat in the Atlantic Ocean waters in late November. But is that what Captain Briggs ordered? And if so, why? The silent witness to whatever happened that day is the ship itself. If only the Mary Celeste could talk we would know exactly what happened. As for the Mary Celeste, her end was far less mysterious. For the next 12 years, she had 17 different owners. In November of 1884, she was sailed into a reef just off the coast of Haiti, wrecked by a captain who was trying to scam his insurance company. The ship got hung up on coral and it wouldn't sink. It was basically a giant, embarrassing flop. They found the ship full of cargo that wasn't worth much money. It was rubber boots and cat food. But he had insured it for more money than what he was really labeling the the cargo as. He and his partner were charged with fraud and the captain died soon after. There is nothing left of the Mary Celeste today. But where the ship got hung up on the coral, it left a huge groove where it came to rest, and it's still visible today thanks to the natives for the last 100 years who have used it as a boat ramp. In 2001, some divers with a film crew went into the water and tried to find pieces of the Mary Celeste. They found what they believed was part of the ship, 
The wooden pieces were tested and found they came from trees in Georgia that were a popular wood to use around the time the Mary Celeste was refitted in 1872. The artifacts are covered in beautiful coral underwater, and it's kind of surreal to see. Remember, there was one member of the Briggs family who survived, their young son, Arthur, who stayed behind to attend school. He was given to a paternal uncle to be raised. He grew up and married and had two children before he died in 1931 at age 66. He is buried in Massachusetts. Next to his grave is a small monument that has his parents and baby sister's names. It, re it reads that they were lost at sea. There are still descendants in the world today of Captain Briggs out there, thanks to his son, Arthur. In 1925, a history author by the name of John Lockhart had written that he believed Captain Briggs went mad and slaughtered everyone on the boat and then committed suicide. He later spoke to some of the captain's descendants and apologized to them for writing that, and he withdrew it from his book. You guys have all heard of Arthur Conan Doyle. He was a famous author, most notably known for writing Sherlock Holmes. Well, he wrote a story inspired by the Mary Celeste. He called the ship the Maria Celeste. Arthur's story is fiction, though, but it tells the story of a ship abandoned in 1872. The ship was taken over by a passenger. He and his fellow conspirators com commandeered the ship and sailed it to Africa and murdered the passengers and crew. Again, total work of fiction, but if it wouldn't have been for him writing this book, we may never have known about the Mary Celeste. It could have been lost in history like so many other stories. But people love mysteries. They love true crime. You know, they read the story and they want to know what the inspiration was for it. There was also a British movie that came out in 1935 called The Mystery of the Mary Celeste and also released in the U.S. under the title Phantom Ship. It was a fictional story about a man played by the amazing Bela Lugosi, who you guys probably know from Dracula and other horror movies. He played this deranged passenger who kills Captain Briggs and his wife, Sarah, and the others on the ship one by one. I think it's on Amazon Prime, as well as a new horror movie from 2020 titled The Haunting of the Mary Celeste. That's it for this week. Rest in peace to everyone who was on the Mary Celeste and every person I talked about in this story. These folks are long gone at this point. My sources are listed in the description area. Take care and much love to you all.